Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sunny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be rejoined today by the entertainment strategy guy now. Uh, the entertainment strategy guy, uh, one of my favorite sub stacks. Uh, I, I read him, I subscribe. I read him, uh, you know, every every week when he posts, sometimes multiple times a week. Sometimes we got stuff over at the Ankler as well from, uh, from the ESG, which is great. Uh, but glad to have him back on today to talk about a very important subject, failure. Failure yep. is uh, under under discussed and underappreciated in this uh, era of streaming war, streaming combat, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, thanks for being back on the show. Really appreciate it. Happy to be back. This is one of my favorite articles I produce each year. So um, you more you love to revel in failure. No, and I even wrote that that this year <laughs> it bummed me out. But I think as where I'm sure we'll get into. This is one of the things about the streaming wars, specifically the content side that most people still just don't know about, which is what work. We know what works for the most part. I actually really agree with that, but a lot of people don't realize exactly how much misses out there in the world. So, well, all right. So let's, let's, uh, let's break this down because as you, as you mentioned in the, the intro to the, uh, the piece on TV streaming TV show hits that, that, uh, have flopped, you know, there was a there was a story in Bloomberg, I think it was mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago that was like nobody nobody knows what's failing, and I, even I reading that was like I I got a pretty good sense of what yep. is not working out there. I mean, I feel like I look at the Nielsen charts enough and and look at the other stuff to kind of have a sense of what is working and what isn't working. Uh, but you have you know, if not quite a rigorous formula, you have at least uh, a, a a sense of what is going on via a bunch of different inputs. Can you break down? for us very quickly uh, how you uh, kind of look at what constitutes success and what constitutes failure and the different inputs that you use? Yeah. Um, so I actually do, I like sort of try to middle ground. I do think we don't know what fail, or it's not that we don't know what fails. We would know what fails if people actually like sought out that information. Can I actually do you a quick, ask you a quick question, which I think like illuminates this really quick. Um, Okay, so what are the biggest films in theaters this year, on in theaters, in America? So. Well, it, well, okay, it depends on what we're looking at here. Are we looking at just, just pure total box gross. office total, total gross? Or, yeah, total, total gross. gross? Yeah. Uh, okay, total worldwide gross. Uh, I mean, Super Mario Brothers movies number one, Barbie's number two. Uh, you're looking at probably Oppenheimer getting up to number right. three. Um, it, it, that that would be the the top three. You can name them off the top of your head really quick. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. What's the biggest films on streaming so far this year? Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see. That's a great question. No idea. Right. I would so assume I they're that... all on Netflix. But let me, let me, all right, let yeah. me take an actual shot at answering that. I, yeah. I would assume they're all, they're all, if we're looking just purely at number of hours watched, they're all Netflix originals, things like Heart of Stone or, you know, what, whatever. We don't know else. Heart of Stone yet, but, um, yeah, keep going. I, I, I just find this like fascinating because I think it gets to the impact. No, I mean, I, I literally I, I'm I'm now racking my brain. I would let's see. Extraction two is probably yep, one of that's the, number the five three. biggest. That's number three. OK. Uh, um, the second biggest, know. I'll give you a hint, starred J-Lo. Oh, mother. The mother. Yeah. And the but mother, the number yeah. one that I think no one would get was you people. That came out in February around Valentine's Day. Um, Wait, is that the Jonah Hill one? Yes. Yeah. The Jonah Hill Eddie Murphy one? Yes, exactly. Oh, wow. That's, that's the number one through the first four weeks. And then uh, Prime Video actually got one title on there. But so then I bring this up because the other flip side of that is, can you name the biggest box office bomb of the year? Mm. Well, again, a, like... That's that's a that's a tricky question to answer because if you're if you're looking at box office bomb you're you're really thinking about it in relation to yeah but, uh, but that's into in, in relation to budget right but so what is it flash oh, right and number two is either Mission Impossible or Indiana Jones but the point is you got the flash off the top of your head when it comes to doing streaming if something misses the charts you know but if we can't even remember what the hits were a lot of times if it misses the charts we don't know what they are. So mm -hmm. to, to tie it all the way back to my methodology, what I do now is every week I publish a streaming ratings report, but that report is essentially a rollup of all the data sources that provide publicly available information or provide information to me. And that includes three sources that track viewership, 
specifically Nielsen, Samba TV, and um, Show Labs by Plum Research. They all track either the total hours produced or they track the number of unique viewers watching a show. They provide either a top 10 list broken out or they provide a top five list. What I do when I put this list together is I track everything that comes out every week and I try and find how it does on those ratings. And if something either missed the charts completely, which I call a dog not barking after the Sherlock Holmes short story, or if the ratings are very low and it's very expensive or has very top tier talent in it, I label those flops, misses, or bombs. I don't have a specific definition for those yet. I'm actually working on it. And then I check other sorts of metrics of interest. These are like you mentioned, real good TV time. Those are app applications that allow customers to say, I want to watch this show and they click a button. So that's an interest level metric. That's very high that someday they probably will watch this show. Or I look at IMDb because that's actual customer ratings. And it says, did I enjoy this show? And the total number of reviews along with the rating is a pretty good proxy for some of those things. And so I make this big list for every streamer. And then I basically put into three categories, which is, is it in competition for the biggest miss of the quarter half for them so far? Is it an honorable mention or is it just a miss? Or do I take it off the list because I think it did well enough? And there's a ton of edge cases, but that's it. I leave out certain types of content as well, which I think we'll talk about, but I don't do kids content. And for the most part, I try and avoid uh, reality shows in unscripted documentaries because they tend to be cheap, but that doesn't mean they're missing a lot of misses. It just means like, for example, Citadel, which is by some reports, the second most expensive TV show of all time is definitely a much bigger swing and a miss sort of like the flash than say, you know, um, there's like another prime video show that I had on the charts, um, like the rig or something like that. Those shows aren't as expensive. So while there's still misses, they're not, to the same degree that something like Citadel is. And so that's my mm -hmm. rough calculation. And then I make these big lists and then I publish them all so everyone can know what missed. Though again, it's for the whole half of the year. And I wanna, I wanna just uh, emphasize for folks that we're talking pure numbers here. You're not uh, yeah. factoring in critical acclaim, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Emmy wins, whatever, Oscar nominations, whatever. This is not, uh, this is not a measure of quality exactly, Correct. but, uh, popularity. Many of these shows I'm writing about, I am a big fan of, I thought were very good. Um, I have one on Disney plus that I loved, but again, it didn't make the ratings chart. So my opinions don't matter. And again, to the point with critics, um, there definitely is a role for content that is critically acclaimed and that will win those awards. I think that field overall is pretty crowded, so it actually can be tough to get a good ROI, but that's not what I'm evaluating here because whether or not things are good critically beloved or doing well in the awards most other people know those things already so that's not really that they don't really need me because in that, those cases Rotten Tomatoes really can provide the guide yeah but can I I want to I want to drill down into just one of your inputs uh for a second mm -hmm. because I know I know some folks you you get sometimes some pushback on using IMDb um, mm -hmm. Because IMDb uh, is it, first, it's entirely user uh, generated, right? It's you know, it's Correct. people you know assigning ratings, or whatever, which creates a which creates a, an issue uh, just in terms of um, specifically campaigning, right? Correct. People campaigning yep. to make things you know higher rated or lower rated, um, but also it just it, it appeals to a certain. There's a certain built-in user base there already that uh, kind of prefers certain, uh, like Christopher Nolan yep. has, I think, nine of the 250 top films on IMDb, right? And as much as I, as, uh, I am a well-known and registered with the government, Christopher Nolan shill, um, but the but that all, that strikes me as a little a little over the top. Yeah. So I'm the last Tenet fan, I think, in America, and so I agree <laughs> with you, but. His interstellar scores when they recently made the charts because it switched services are we're over like 2 million IMDb review votes, which is insane. Um, so yeah, so when I use IMDb to be totally clear, I actually check every score to see if it was campaigned. And you can tell something's been campaigned because there's a large number of 10 star votes or one star votes. We have seen a lot more in the last year, a lot of shows getting more positive campaigns. So if folks are really into something they all go and throw a 10 votes and you can tell that the 10 votes 
are really not in line with like, it should look like a normal distribution. And if it doesn't, it's been subject of a campaign. But that's it. If something's been subject of a negative campaign, I just sort of ignore all the ratings, um, except in one case that popped up because it was so extreme. It's like the greatest IMDb score ever, which is Velma, because their number of one star votes was from everyone. So there was no one positive campaigning it, which you don't really see. So I ignore those. You also mentioned genre skew, which I think is absolutely super important. And it's something I try and take, I definitely take into account, though I haven't done a full quantitative system that's on my data roadmap. Um, but I try and only compare shows to similar shows in their genre. So if you're talking, does something have high ratings for a superhero show? You don't compare it to other dramas. You don't compare it to reality shows, which do very poorly on IMDb. So I only use it as sort of a backstop, especially for the shows that aren't making any of the ratings to sort of see, hey, is this picking up and getting some you know, steam that I'm not seeing, especially if its ratings are over an eight? Because to your point, it doesn't mean it's broadly popular then, but it means it's popular within its niche, which can still be a good thing. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, importantly, you look at total number of reviews, which I think is the most yeah. interesting uh, yeah. and objective part of all this. It's not it's not strictly speaking, you know, hey, this got a 7.2. It's right. this got a 7.2 with, you know, 100,000 reviews. Right. Um, I've actually seen a, ratings. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I actually seen a lot of people use just the ratings. And I specifically have a, th a rough threshold that if it doesn't get over 10,000 reviews and say the first three months, it's really probably not that popular. Um, and we kind of know that. So you really need to look at both the rating with the review. I would also point out that um, I also only use IMDb because most of the other customer review sites just don't have the volume of metrics on the TV side to really justify their use, mainly meaning Metacritic's user reviews um, and Rotten Tomatoes. Because a lot of times you see the Rotten Tomatoes critic score to customer score some of those customer scores can be in the hundreds of reviews. So it's just really not that notable. The one exception is Letterboxd, which actually is really getting a big following and actually does, can have a lot of movies that have quite a few number of reviews, but I haven't started tracking that data yet. Yeah, I, I love, I just uh, interject here. I love Letterboxd and I uh, specifically, I love looking at the, um, they actually have a little handy chart usually on every individual movie. Uh, showing the distribution of reviews okay. and you yeah. can you can you can look at them and you can see you almost always see a bell curve of some sort um, you know right. sometimes it's skewed toward five stars sometimes it's yeah. skewed toward one stars but you don't generally see you know uh, low then a, then a middle rise then you know kind of back down um, uh, and you can always tell when something has been campaigned against as you say or is you know has has transgressed against something with the user base on letterbox which I think is a little younger and a little more progressively inclined, yep. uh, shall we say. Um, you can always tell when those movies have, have transgressed, there are movies that transgress against this, those sensibilities because they will skew very sharply uh, like a ski slope down. Um, right. And then there will be like a little uptick, a little bump at the end but w w when somebody counters. And uh, you can to... find those on IMDb. You just have to click on the review. Mm -hmm. And then you can find that same bell curve. But yeah, so yeah. I like Letterbox. I think it'd be useful. I just haven't done the process to actually compare them. Um, but having a good, the number of reviews is a good double check on whether or not something's getting popular. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about, let's talk about a, one specific show before we get into a, a more broader discussion to kind of, uh, crystallize some of these things. Uh, I mentioned before we, before we started, um, the show on Apple TV plus hijack. Now hijack yep. is a, a show that jumps out to me as. A hit. It, it, it's a. Uh, it's my my friends are watching it. We're we're talking about it. Um, my wife uh, was like, we should watch the show. I was like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll watch the show. Um, and she is not, you know, uh, necessarily paying attention to all the the new stuff that's coming out. So that's usually an indicator that something is broken through to me when when my when my wife um, uh, recognizes it. Um, and um, on top of that, uh, it was a. I think it was at the top of the real good charts. You know, I get the emails, mm -hmm. the top ten from real good. It was on the the top of those charts for uh, for a couple weeks. I know the just watch folks were, I think, uh, into it as well. Um, uh, but I I was a little bit surprised to see it make the honorable mention miss. Like not not really a miss, but an honorable mention almost miss. Uh, on your in your email. Um, what so what what what's the disconnect there? What am I what am I 
as a viewer and as a critic, not experiencing correctly from a numerical standpoint? I think you're experiencing it correctly. The one thing which we pointed out above is you mentioned Just Watch and Real Good. They're examples of interest metrics. One thing I've definitely noticed with all the interest metrics, including TV time, where it had a four week run on TV time, which is pretty good, but never got above fifth place in the interest metrics. The one one of scenario I've noticed with interest metrics is like IMDb, they definitely have a certain audience and genre skews. And that's because in most cases, unless the companies are very, very good about having panels that are uh, you know, representative of people across the country, you're essentially people are opting into those applications. Most of those applications tend to start with Apple apps. So there could be some bias. And again, I can't prove this. I don't have all their data, but this is what I see where, you know, customers who tend to be higher income tend to be more likely to be mobile phone owners, tend to be more likely to be cord cutters, tend to use these applications. And I think Apple TV Plus's strategy is to deliver content to those types of customers. So in a sign, the fact they're doing good on those interest metrics, doing well on those interest metrics is a sign that they're delivering on the customers they're targeting. But this gets back to where whenever we're dealing with lots and lots of data, you know, it's as much an art as it is a science and there's philosophy behind it. And one of the big challenges whenever I'm writing a streaming ratings report is making is doing the evaluation. Is this show a hit or is this show a hit for Apple TV Plus? And so hijacks the perfect example where it's something that I'd say, I think it's absolutely a hit for Apple TV Plus. Um, mm -hmm. And again, there's a lot of edge cases. And in this case, Based off, we did get a Samba TV, what I call Dadicdote, where they say how many households watched it. And they said uh, 460,000 watched it in the first week. What's funny about that, though, is uh, Samba TV, when they've released these selective data points, they've never actually, they've only rarely done it over the same time period. So we only have one other show to compare it to over the first week, and that's Platonic at 300,000 households. Uh, or in the first six days. And then you have, and then we only have a handful of other shows. So hijack on that metric is like, is on the higher end. But that said, if we're comparing 467,000 households to something that like, you know, the Witcher that did 1.2 million, tough to say that that drop off means that this thing's a huge hit. And then the other factor when it comes to Apple TV plus is they almost, when it comes to scripted content, nothing looks cheap and everything has top tier talent. Uh, Idris Elba, I don't think he's working for free. I don't think he's working for scale. I think he got a huge paycheck to make that TV show. So I like try and factor those things in. And that's why I didn't call it their biggest miss because I think some other shows were more expensive and had clear, much lower ratings. Um, but I would say it's the closest they have through the first half of the year of being on the edge of being say not a not a miss or a hit, just sort of in the middle. Um, Servant would be one of those as well that I know I put on the list. Um, yeah, is that all? Me? That, yeah, I. You know what? Here, one more point too. Actually, when I'm thinking about it. the other point, which I also really hold against Apple TV Plus, is that um, when you do go to a service that uses really a representative sample size, like Nielsen. The show never made the Nielsen charts, any of the data we have so far. We haven't gotten the, the data for the third week of July. So it could surprise us and make the charts for the third week of July, but it likely won't. And so that just means you have a show that wasn't one of the top 10 most viewed in America. And if Apple had never had Ted Lasso make those lists, I can maybe say, well, Apple just can't make the list because their user base is too small. But Ted Lasso was on the charts, uh, one of the longest running shows this year so far. So when it comes to a show that is genuinely really popular, Ted Lasso did really, really well. Now it is in its third season. There's some caveats like that. But adding all those things up, I still think Hijack was an expensive miss uh, for Apple. For when you look at the TV environment as a whole, though it might be one of Apple TV Plus's better performing shows this year. Yeah. Do the do do the the services like uh, Just Watch and Real Good uh, skew toward smaller networks like Apple or I, when I say smaller, I just mean uh, uh, networks that are not necessarily the first stop for everybody. So net, not like a Netflix or, you so, know, 
Hulu or Max, right? So, like, does it would would they possibly skew toward the smaller networks like yeah. that because people just don't know where some someone's like I'm, I've heard about this show Hijack. What network is it on? So they pull up Just Watch to find out where it is, and then that's yeah. how they 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 get there. Uh, that absolutely could happen. I think more what happens, even though Netflix tends to do well on the charts, is that Netflix is more penalized for that. So I think they truly are the first stop. Same with Prime Video. I think they get penalized a little bit on that metric, um, though I haven't seen it enough with the smaller services. I think Apple TV Plus is the one that does the best on the TV time charts. They definitely over-index there compared to some of the other metrics. Though I will say a lot of their shows do tend to be speculative fiction or science fiction. Those tend to do well in the IMDb charts. So Apple TV Plus has had some shows that really accumulate IMDb viewers. Like Hijack, for example, does have 30,000 reviews, but it only has a 7.5. So it's sort of like right on the edge for being a very good show um, overall. I know the show they had last year, uh, Blackbird did well, um, which I had called that one a big miss, which it was because it missed all the ratings charts, but it came from uh, Richard Plepler's company and had a lot of buzz behind it. It ended up right now, it's it's over, I think, 80,000 IMDb reviews. So its audience found it. Um, but more what I would say is the Netflix effect, I wouldn't trust. They don't need TV time because they're so big. So if a show doesn't do well on TV time for Netflix, I don't really factor that in. I will also say the superhero shows do insanely well on TV time. So uh, Secret Invasion, which was never the top show in America, was number one on the charts for five straight weeks. So the superhero shows have a bias, and then uh, Star Trek shows do very well as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Do the Star Trek shows are they showing up on the Nielsen's very often? So Paramount Plus wasn't tracking. Uh, Nielsen wasn't tracking Paramount Plus, I believe, until February, or maybe oh, okay. it was earlier. So we didn't know. But since they have started tracking them, Picard has shown up. I think it showed up for two weeks, and then Strange New Worlds has been hopping on and off the charts uh, during its new one, which Strange New Worlds is a version of my hijack that everyone's telling me I need to get on and watch that one. So, <laughs> Yes, I've gotten, I've had that conversation as well. I'm like, look, I love Picard because it's just force feeding me the member berries. And right. that's all I, that's all I actually want. I don't want new, I don't want new stories and, and that sort of thing. I just want, I just want mm -hmm. to relive my youth. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about why it matters to track these. Let's. Just, I, I want to. I want to just. I'm going to pick on a network here. I'm going to okay. pick on Max. Okay, I'm okay. going to pick on Max. So uh, here's the thing. I watch Max a lot. Uh, I watch a lot of shows. Uh, you know, on HBO, HBO Max, whatever, whatever it's called now. Uh, I like the network, uh, even though it has uh, the the rebrand and everything that they have done to it has made it a much more difficult thing for me to deal with and track and and whatever whatever. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into yelling about David Zaslav right now. Uh, but like I, I I watch a lot of TV on Max is what I'm saying, and I'm looking I'm looking at the I, I was looking at the list of TV misses on Max and I did not recognize half of the I literally did not recognize half of these shows just did not did not uh know what they were um so here here are the, some of the shows uh on here's the the entire list of misses that you have on uh for for Max uh let's see and just like that The Climb Clone High Downey's Dream Cars Fired on Mars Funny or Dies High Science The Other Two Smartless on the Road Swiping America Ten-year-old Tom, Warrior, What Am I Eating with Zoe Deschanel, and Velma, the previously mentioned Velma. So that that that's let's see, that's what uh, twelve titles or so here. I would say that I am I could actually describe what the show is in four of the cases there, which means that eight of them I just like I, I actually really liked Fired on Mars, funny show. People should check it out. But like I, uh, you know, most of these shows on here, I I don't even know what they are. I don't know. I don't know what they are. Uh, how can you run a successful um, a successful streaming company when your some of your most loyal customers look at your uh, lineup of programming that you have spent at least tens and possibly you know low nine figures of millions on uh, and uh, don't don't they they just don't know what they don't know what it is. Well, I mean, so that I mean, you basically 
justify the explanation in a nutshell. I mean, when I, I think for a while in the streaming wars, the whole disruption that moved to streaming, for a while we sort of forgot some core principles of both entertainment and then business and say, smash them together, the entertainment business. And one of them is that when you're making shows, it really is a portfolio game. But the reason it's a portfolio game is because the hits pay for the misses. But overall, you're trying to get that return on investment. So the hits pay for the misses so long as you don't make so many misses that the hits can't afford to pay for them. And so that's what when the reason why I think it's so important is to know what the misses are is for the before we had streaming ratings and especially when everyone was funding deficit financed operations no one focused on what the misses were because it just didn't matter the return on investment wasn't there because it was all about subscriber growth and then once you got subscriber growth there's gonna be to turn back to profitability now that everyone's focused on profitability the return on investment comes back to the four so the question is if you can make uh it's actually like i think 16 shows of which dedicated customers can identify five of them. Even if they might not be the intended audience, the lesson there is you need to identify which of those shows not to make in the first place, especially because even on Max, the biggest hits so far this year all came from HBO shows. So clearly the HBO with Max distribution model makes sense, or you need to go back to the start and figure out how you can launch shows, this many shows, and get people to actually watch them in real time, um, which again, not saying that's that easy to challenge, but you have to know how many shows miss because that's the basic input to are we succeeding based off the hits. All right, I want to, I want to, I want to drill down on one point here. Okay. When we and I agree with this, hits pay for the misses, right? right? This is this is a bedrock idea of entertainment, mm -hmm. and that's basically how the industry has worked for years. Uh, you know, uh, but when we say the hits pay for the misses. I don't understand exactly how you quantify that in in uh, in in modern times in modern streaming TV, right? Because when you say the hits pay for the misses, a hit TV show like Friends right. pays for the misses because you can charge way more money for ads on Friends, you know, back in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, or Seinfeld, right? You're you're you can charge advertisers obscene amounts of money for a 30 second spot. Uh, and that is what that is what makes money. And then it goes to syndication, whatever. There's other revenue streams. The revenue waterfall is is deep and long, whatever. But like that, all right. That's how it. Or with a movie, movie, much much simpler case. Right. The hits, the Oppenheimer. You pay. You you bring in nine hundred million dollars in ticket sales worldwide, and that pays for you know your I don't know Renfields or whatever um, uh, that that don't that don't that don't quite that don't hit. Um, uh, and I actually enjoyed Renfield. I don't want to sound like, but I, but like, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, all right. So like that, but in streaming, there is no, it's not like it's the, the idea of what works and what doesn't work is so diffuse that I don't, I'm not entirely sure how you say, all right. Uh, I don't know the righteous gemstones or something or succession, right? That covers, uh, uh, that covers, I don't know, the other two and swiping America. You know, I like, I, I don't, I just don't understand how you break this down. So I don't think you're wrong to say you don't understand it because I think this is actually, I, I was just reading, I think an article on CNN where someone said, you know, all the streamers value different things and we don't know what they value. So it's very complicated. So we don't know. And you read, you wrote a, actually a terrific column a few, maybe a couple months ago about how, Hollywood's big problem is that we don't actually value things with dollars anymore, that breaking down all those markets has actually made it much tougher to identify what success is and relatedly how to share profits. It's a point I totally agree with. Um, again, to go back to what I was saying like five, 10 years ago is when I saw the streaming model was for films in particular, say go from theatrical to home entertainment to second windows, and we're going to condense it all down into one, which is only streaming. It never made sense to me how that pie is bigger and so how you share that pie. That all said, while it's harder and more difficult, when I say pay for itself, really in this case, I'm not talking about actual dollars and cents, though it can translate to that. It really is talking about something like the 
acquiring of new customers and the retaining of old customers is basically the job of every piece of content on your platform. And so shows that are huge hits will acquire more of them and they will retain more of them. And you can put a quantitative measure on those things and you can triangulate how well the content is doing based on things like the viewership, the completion rate, and the total number of customers. So when, to use like a, a much easier example than like Max, when I ask what hits paid for all the misses, cause you know, Netflix, if you scroll down in the article, they had quite a few misses as well. They had more shows make the Nielsen charts, but you know, if you factor in budgets, they still had a lot of shows that are misses for them. But we know that Wednesday essentially paid for all their misses in November and December because so many people watched it and watched it for so long. So they're not paying for it in the sense of actual value, but any show that you keep people on the platform makes it much more likely that they're going to keep their subscription. And if they're going to be more likely to keep their subscription, you can raise prices on them. And if you raise prices, you're generating more value. And so, you know, if Fired on Mars, which is one of the shows on the max list that I had not heard of, but if say it had broken out and a lot of people are like, you have to check out Max to watch this, that's going to pay for say Swiping America or 10 year old Tom or potentially Warrior, right? Because they're tuning in to watch that. And so it's driving the success. So then it's a matter of weighing the number of hits and how big those hits are versus the number of misses. And so for HBO, they've actually done a really interesting strategy in that they're they're doing more and more shows that are going to max. They're doing less fewer originals, but having the shows appear on HBO and then drive viewership on max as well. And in that sense, they actually had a pretty good start to the year between The Last of Us, which was a big, big hit, and Succession, which actually grew enough in the viewership that paid for it. I bring up a show like In Just Like That, the Sex and the City spinoff, that I think would have done better had it been given an opportunity. So it's more a statement that Max just still needs to grow and probably make yeah, a few they, less shows. Did, did Max not put and just like that on HBO? Was that streaming exclusive? Yes, it was. Wow. Uh, that's, that seems idiotic. I mean, I could double check, uh, okay. but I'm, I'm like, 80%, I, I, so, I don't, yeah. I don't doubt. I, I, I am not doubting you. I, my, again, my, one of the problems here with all these discussions is that, uh, all of my viewing is skewed because I don't watch anything with advertising anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't ever see any ads. Uh, I pay, I pay extra money for even the services I don't use every week, like Peacock, yep. not to see ads ever on the rare occasion that I do. So like everything is kind of, it just shows up on the app or it doesn't. For me, which is a terrible way to go through life, right. um, if you want to understand how these things work, I will just say again: "Fired on Mars." Very, it's the it's the best Mike Judge show that Mike Judge has nothing to do with, as far as I can tell. Nice. Um, but it's it's great. People people should check it out. So you uh, haven't on Peacock jumped on the Super Mario Brothers bandwagon? I'm actually very curious to see how that movie does for them. I think it'll. I assume it's going to do very well, right? I mean, all the the animated things have have done pretty well on uh, Peacock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, from Universal, haven't they? Minions. I, and... They they have. I just think Super Mario might be in a different level. And the one yeah. prediction I'm trying to guess is my or one of the predictions I've made is I think it will be the biggest film on Netflix this year because it's coming out in December. If the four month you know delay is right, it and again it could not. You never know how they do it, but it it should come yeah. out around December eighth. And if it's it'll essentially be going up your against your favorite Zack Snyder's rebel moon so that'll make an so very saying fun I have to cheer against super mario yes that's, that's what i'm saying that's what <laughs> i uh <laughs> no i uh i i have we have not watched it on peacock uh because my children uh for my birthday got me a copy of super mario brothers movie it was very thoughtful of them okay uh they bought it for me on blu-ray nice uh so i could watch it not them uh, very, very thoughtful. That's a very thoughtful I gift really, to get you. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate. It. I really appreciated that. Uh, but the um, uh, okay, all right. So let's uh, let us uh, move off from Fired on Mars, which is a good show people should watch, uh, and talk about um, you. You you uh, have a piece over at the Ankler about uh, the general uh, failures of sports documentaries, mm -hmm. sports programming. Um, but not I want to be clear here, not live sports programming. Uh, we're talking about like documentaries, TV shows, that sort of thing. And one of the one of the the nuggets that had jumped out in your um, in your emails was uh, just how incredibly poorly watched the various LeBron James 
uh, specials mm-hmm. shows have been. Like there was, I think one of one of them uh, had something like 150 uh, IMDb ratings, which yep. is, I mean, functionally zero. Yep. Um, why is it that sports, and also I get the sense that nature documentaries like the dinosaur CGI thing on uh, on on Apple or Disney or wherever that was. Um, uh, why, why do, why do, why aren't these things hitting with audiences in, in the way that, you know, something like, uh, earth, the earth, the planet earth show on yep. BBC used to kind of hit with audiences that, so to go back to the question is why aren't they hitting? I don't quite have, I don't quite know the answer to that. Like it's, it's actually a puzzle. Um, you brought up planet earth, which I think is the right example. I believe Planet Earth and Planet Earth 2 are still two of the top IMDb f- ser- TV series of all time by total, by ratings and number of reviews. So they definitely hit there. Um, so when it comes to nature documentaries, I still haven't figured out why per se they're not hitting with audiences. We just know that whatever the base is that really had those shows pick up and like drive, like again, when they were on AMC and BBC American and PBS and everyone was watching these Planet Earth, that viewership just haven't translated. Netflix, another one, I believe their version is called Our Planet. Um, and it has David Attenborough or Richard Attenborough, wait, which one? Um, but whoever is the, you know, the it might be his last nature documentary he narrates, and it's from the BBC team. It's just massively more expensive than what the BBC team makes each year, and it didn't make the charts. So for whatever reason nature documentaries seem to be the type of content that people would watch on the linear TV screens of old, but they're not picking to watch amongst all the deluge of scripted content that's out there. When it comes to sports in particular though, and this is what my piece in the Inkler is about, I think there's just a very clear distinction that a lot of the streamers want to get into the sports game, but they don't want to pay the like eye-watering prices required to get into the sports game. We've even heard rumblings that even Amazon's like, we're very happy with the NFL, but it was really expensive. And we want to do a couple more seasons to see if we're actually going to make our money back. But I think the NFL, the Thursday Night Football and Amazon's a perfect example is I believe it was the most, if you just go by total hours viewed, it was the most watched show last year, or it's amongst like top three, something like that. So it's like, if you have actual live sports, particularly the most popular sport in America, football, you get the viewership. When you drop down from that and say, okay, well, let's go to basketball, a slightly less popular league, and now let's make a documentary about one part of that, or we make a show inspired by one of the characters, there's so much other scripted content that it being basketball on its own won't help it thrive. It has to be great and good for basketball, movie, or show to sort of get to those peaks. And like the example is, you know, Peacock had a a biopic about LeBron James, who's argue, who's the biggest basketball star in America, in the world, and it has 1.5 thousand IMDb reviews right now. Most people, even basketball fans, couldn't tell you what it was called. So I think that's more a sign that if you wanna get into sports, you have to actually have live sports itself. And documentaries can be good and people can watch them and they can have, say, a good shelf life, but it's not the same as having the actual sports itself. What do you make of Apple's foray into some of, uh, I, I mean, you could describe them as niche sports, right? MLS, um, but also uh, MLB. I mean, Major League Baseball. They have a they have a deal there. It, it feels like Apple is making the biggest moves into sports, mm-hmm. but also at the lowest stakes. Yeah, like, for example, with the baseball ones, right, isn't it only, I believe, like a handful of games with like a wraparound thing? So it's like a way to like dive in and get it. I do think there's partly a piece with the sports. And again, with Apple, always put out the caveat that, you know, this is which I sort of I hear it so often that it like starts bug me, but it's a loss leader for them so they can lose money on it. Um, I personally think that it would be better if every company had to tell exactly how much money they were losing to Wall Street. So then that way you don't have any economic distorting things. And if people want to know what's wrong with Hollywood, people willing to lose money on projects is not sustainable. And therefore it does distort the various economics. My gut is they are trying to really test the markets because for Apple TV, and I think this actually benefits a lot of their shows, 
their goal is really to get as many devices into homes so they can get as many people signing up for services, but then also just tied tighter into the Apple ecosystem. Sports are a great way to do that because it becomes must watch content for certain groups of people. And you can sort of justify those costs. That said, I think we're going to see across all sports that niche sports. And again, I wouldn't put baseball in this, but I would put MLS for lack of a better word. They really don't drive as much viewership as people think because it really does drop off a cliff. I'm not saying it's NFL or bust in America, but in a lot of ways it is like you either have the NFL and you can really upcharge a lot of those things or you don't. And so until you actually have some of that football, it gets much harder. And then I would put basketball, baseball, uh, oh, and college football as well. Yeah. The MLS thing is interesting to me, though, uh, from a from a very specific it, like almost I mean, I, I guess it's probably not a coincidence. It probably it probably is all tied together. But the acquisition of Messi, Lionel mm-hmm. Messi, one of, you know, arguably one of the greatest soccer players ever. I'll tell you what I see every time I turn on Apple TV plus now is a row of programming options uh, offering me chances to pay them extra money. So I can see all of Messi's games, and I that doesn't work on me because I'm not an MLS right. fan. Um, uh, I I am uh, I'm a soccer snob. I only watch the Euros. Uh, but the but the but the but the, but, it, but it but it I could see it I could see it working on you know the five hundred thousand hardcore dedicated MLS fans in this right. country, or the you know seven hundred fifty thousand hardcore MLS. Uh, fans in this country and if you get a significant amount of them to sign up well all right then then they're tied to the service they're paying extra for the mls package like i could see that making sense uh but it is it's still it, you know to your point it's small potatoes compared to the nfl and it could work but again i also think there's just a myth for whether or not those people are willing to pay it um the other problem with sports content in a lot of cases is that if it does get too expensive to join the apple ecosystem you just pirate the streams somewhere else. I actually think that, again, we mentioned piracy last time, but I I think that's actually one of the biggest issues. I'll point out though, one of those interesting things about describing that Apple TV plus behavior is the top bar when someone enters one of your applications is very expensive real estate. And I think a lot of people forget that. And it, it can actually in a lot of ways drive viewership to various shows and films. So essentially when Apple's saying we're devoting this to the MLS to help make the deal justify itself, that actually comes at the cost of the other shows. For example, Hijack could be up there instead, or a show from another streaming service could be up there instead. And I actually think that also helps a lot of Apple TV Plus shows is that they can put their shows right up there, where say Peacock or Disney Plus would have to pay them to get a show up there in the marketing campaign, which is exactly um what happens something i don't think people realize they think that's just like a spot up there but it definitely can influence things so um so to the point i haven't seen all the particulars of the mls deal you know one of the i wish i could see the contract and i'd have a field day like looking at it the one worry though is even getting someone into that ecosystem it makes it you know to your point much earlier in the conversation about how do you value those things The whole, we got someone into the ecosystem is a lot of times a very good fudge factor to justify companies making bad decisions that we don't actually know about because they don't provide open financials. And if everyone provided open financials, sort of like all the traditional companies in Netflix, we'd have a much better idea for how well they're subsidizing these things or not and could have the conversation on is that subsidization good or even working. I think right now they benefit a lot because what is Apple of three lines of business? Um, you know, and their services business would probably make the fortune 100 by itself, you know, so maybe even higher. Uh, so it's just something I think about. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's jump to a slightly different topic, uh, though, along the same lines when we're talking about streaming. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in your discussion of film flops, um, is that if you make a movie, you should put it in theaters. Yep. Now this is a subject near and dear to my heart, uh, for a number of reasons, Um, but the, uh, but, but the broader point here is that an advertising campaign creates awareness, not just for theatrical release, it creates excitement for the streaming release, but doesn't this really, what aren't, aren't what you really saying is that there just need to be fewer movies made period. And the ones that are made need to go to theaters. And then those movies need to come to streaming services. I'm not 
saying that specifically, but you could assume that. I actually, I mean, <laughs> in today's climate, I don't want to say like, yes, make fewer movies because, you know, it benefits everyone to make more movies. I think um, right. I was just having another conversation where I think the main conversation in town when it comes to the theatrical films, especially the ones flopping, is the budget situation. So again, the other way to describe it is, um, do the budgets make sense for how much they're returning? So I think you could make these films for streaming, but the films should look a lot like the movies that were made for TV back in the day, which means Hallmark movies, which means some of those broadcast like uh, multi-night events, but they are not the same high quality as blockbusters. And so if all the blockbusters say came down in budget by 25% and your streaming films were made for a more reasonable amount, they would make sense on the various platforms with the caveat that except for Netflix, most of the time your film that comes out straight to streaming is not going to achieve the same cultural awareness and same viewership upside. Though, again, as we went over, you know, we forgot the names of the mother and you people in the three other films. So arguably, even then they don't have the cultural upside, but they can have the viewership impact that's a little bit higher. Um, so I think all the budgets need to come down, especially for the streaming only films. That said, if you really are devoting the effort to make some of these films, like the example, uh, I have a couple examples that I think really would have benefited from it. Um, it the Tetris movie, it sounds like customers really like that one. And it was on Apple TV plus earlier. If you put that in theaters and you have the stars go out, does that get some sort of buzz and put it in the box in the Academy Award conversation? Maybe white men can't jump and you people both looked very, very funny. So can they, you know, counter program, get some people in the audiences for a smart, effective marketing campaign. And then Disney in particular, um, you know, figuring out when it's films should go to theaters and when they should be in theaters, Peter Pan and Wendy. I mean, the other, I think after put your films in theaters, your other biggest point is make more kids movies, Peter Pan and Wendy is a kid's movie and it didn't go to theaters. So no one watched it. Yeah. Yeah, these are these are my hobby horses. More yeah. movies in theaters, and specifically more movies I can take my children to to kill four hours on a weekend. Yep, yeah. and that, I, those are those are my priorities. I'm and firmly I, with I you. We more people. Should. We saw Teenage Kraken in theaters, so that's how much. Same. We, that's Same. How, that's how much we were ready. I've, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm surprised that movie didn't get a bigger push. My, my daughter, my daughter really liked it. I mean, she's you know uh, seven year old. At the time, she was seven and uh, really, really enjoyed the, uh, you know, kind of yeah. uh, awkward teen tween sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't I did not make any sense to me why that got totally buried. And I think it got uh, buried by the calendar because the other thing the theatrical does is they really seem to compress the calendar into those two months of May and June for some reason. Um, I also think, you know, like now that August is emptying out would have been a good time i i also would wonder if disney seeing the you know oncoming freight train of barbenheimer would have moved haunted mansion to halloween which to me you should release halloween movies and halloween and then when they come out on streaming guess what they'll be popular next halloween if they're good you know um so to your larger point, though, about should the films go to streaming, uh, I am going to keep updating my series on that. I think I did three articles back in May, then the writer's strike happened, and that sort of distracted all of us. I'm going to keep updating that. I would say tentatively, though, looking at the Nielsen data, um, if we talk about just how well films did on streaming, because I said straight to streaming films earlier, but actually Black Panther 2 and Avatar 2 are both, I think, in the top five. If not, I think the two top films for how well they did. Um, so yeah. that gets, or maybe at least top 10. Yeah. Cause extraction, they did right around the same. So that gets back to the argument that you can get all this box office money and you're still going to get mostly the same streaming numbers. Shouldn't you try and get both? Yeah. Uh, yes. Speaking, speaking my language. All right. Um, that was pretty much everything I wanted to ask. Uh, it, it, as you know, I like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. I think that there's things folks should understand about, uh, you know, the 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 state of the industry or, you know, what why why we should be paying more attention to what misses uh, instead of just what hits. 
Um, what uh, what do you think folks should know? Well, see, I would actually step back. We should actually just first know that we absolutely know what the hits are as well. And if anyone doesn't know, I have a newsletter that covers the hits and misses every week, uh, in addition to a lot of other topics. Um, and that's the biggest thing that, you know, is all the conversation about what's royal in Hollywood. We actually have more data at our disposal than we've ever had before. And we know what the hits and misses are. It's just the coverage of all the hits and misses is sort of as confusing as trying to find all these shows that are coming out on streamers anyways. And knowing any industry to be functioning properly has to mo- incentivize people to make money on the given shows. And while it's tough with straight to streaming because it goes into a big pile and out pops customer things, if we just know what the hits are, we can tie that to those success metrics. And so we need to know that so that everyone up and down the value chain is making good decisions to make the best content possible, which is really you know the point of the entire entertainment industry in the first place. Uh, yes. Making, making value propositions work. That's the Hollywood dream. That's, uh, um, uh, all right. I, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Entertainment Strategy Guy. Again, great newsletter. I'll link to it in my newsletter, uh, so you can, you can check it out. But, uh, I, I strongly recommend it if you want to have a good sense of how the, uh, the, the, you know, actual economics of the streaming age work and what is what is being watched and what isn't uh check it check it out make sure you sign up um strongly recommended uh again my name is sunny bunch i am the culture editor at the bulwark uh, and i will be back next week with another episode of the bulwark goes to hollywood we'll see you guys then